Well, good morning to you. A couple of years ago, I was at a gathering where there were a lot of people present, and uh, a woman came up to me, uh, and she had that expression on her face. She clearly expected me to recognize her. And eventually, honesty being the best policy, I eventually had to say, I'm sorry, I, I just don't remember you. And she said, oh, last time we met, you said something to me that changed my life. I said, oh, really? How often does that happen? What did I say to you? And she said, I'm terribly sorry, I can't remember. <laughs> I hope I do better than that today. I want to tell you a story. Back in the 1990s, I began to visit uh, the Republic of Moldova, which is Europe's poorest country, squashed in between Romania and Ukraine. And as one does, I started a software company there. <laughs> and I observed, in doing so, a truly fascinating phenomenon. Working with my employees, the engineers, I discovered that the precise way in which I chose to ask our engineers questions could have a dramatic effect on the answers I received. For example, I would ask them, is this big project we're working on on track for delivery at the end of the month as it's supposed to be? And they would say, yes. You sure? Yes. After a while, I learned to ask other questions. <laughs> I said, I would say, so um, have you discovered any really interesting problems? You know, the kind of problems that might delay the delivery of the project. And they would say, oh, yes. <laughs> now, these engineers were competent. They were honest. Actually, some of the most amazing people I've ever worked with. What on earth was going on? How could they answer, yes, we're going to deliver on time, and yes, the project is going to be delayed? Well, I think the answer was probably rooted in history. Moldova was uh, a state in the former USSR, and the people I'm talking about, who are now, by the way, great friends, so we got past that issue, um, they had grown up in a situation that had been shaped by decades and decades of totalitarian communism. It's hard for us to imagine what it's like to grow up in a society in which they really do shoot the messenger. There's a very strong taboo that uh, prevents one from being the person who's the bearer of bad news. They had a culturally inherited reluctance to say no to power. Well, happily, a generation on from that, uh, things are very different in Moldova. And I still love going there. But back then, back in the day, I had a challenge that I had to address. How could I ask my question in such a way as to unlock a really useful answer? Of course, anyone who has worked cross-culturally will be familiar with this kind of challenge. It's not unique to Moldova. Uh, it can even happen cross-culturally in a single country like Canada. So um, it just seems to be a fact that in order to get over uh, the problem of uh, cross-cultural communication, in fact, to get over the problem of human-to-human -human communication, even within a single culture, asking better questions has a habit of eliciting better answers. Now, crafting a question to be clear gets to the heart of things more efficiently. But better questions do more than simply clarify. Better questions tap into a previously buried vein of human creativity, sometimes unleashing answers that were literally unthinkable beforehand. Let me explain what I mean with an example. In the world of software development, custom software development, that is. Estimation is really important because the customer wants a job to be done. We have to figure out approximately how much time it will take and come up with a price based on that price. 
Now, there's a problem with estimating software projects, as anyone who works in that field will know. The great philosopher of computing, uh, computer science, Fred Brooks, uh, came up with a great truth. He said, all programmers are optimists, and optimism and estimation don't go together very well. So I would ask my, uh, my colleagues, is the project on track for on-time delivery? Yes. You sure? Yes. No problems? No. OK. And you know where I'm heading. Have you discovered any interesting challenges that uh, need more time than is available in the budget? Maybe. So then I would say, OK, we've got 20 days left in the budget. How many days do you think you need to complete the project? And they'd think, and then they would say, 200 days. <laughs> OK, I see. Tell me the absolute smallest number of days that you need in order to complete the project. About 200 days. <laughs> and we could go round and round this loop, and they could bring out lots of evidence and documentation and charts that would show it was really going to be 200 days of work. So that's when I had to change the question. So I'd say, OK, forget that, forget that. Let's start a different project. Suppose you only had 20 days left to finish this. How much of it could you get done? And my, remember, these are not stupid people. In fact, these are very smart people. And they would start to think about it. And sometimes it would take a day or two to get the result. It was amazing how many times the answer came back. What do you think? All of it. How is that possible? It seemed miraculous. The impossible can be turned into the achievable. Well, Fred Brooks, the philosopher of computer science I mentioned, has another great quote. He said, very good programmers are 10 times as productive as poor ones. And what I discovered is that changing the question, somehow moving people into a different mental space, unlocked their extraordinary human potential. It somehow allowed my programmers to discover their inner genius. In fact, what I discovered is that my engineers were capable of being 10 times better than themselves. It was amazing. We're often encouraged to, to ask open questions. Open questions leave space for different perspectives, allow people to bring different resources to the table. Whiteboarding is all about open questions. What I discovered is that sometimes asking closed questions closes things down and it forces creativity into a corner where remarkable results can be produced. Jack Welch, the legendary chairman and chief executive of General Electric, GE, started working with them in 1981. And shortly after he started, he asked his business use unit managers to set a goal of making their business units the number one or number two player in their markets. And they did really well. For 15 years, the strategy worked, the company grew, and they became dominant. GE businesses sometimes had 50 or even 60% market share in their chosen markets. Then one day in 1995, Jack Welch changed the question. He asked his managers this. He said, can you redefine your market such that your current successful business has no more than a 10% market share? Let me explain what I mean by that. So for example, GE Power Systems had a 63% market share of a $2.7 billion market uh, in parts and repair for GE generators, electricity generators. After redefining their market to take in total power plant maintenance, they had a 10% share of a $17 billion market. They were still doing the same thing. They just saw themselves as playing in a different space, a larger space. Now, these were managers who were used to uh, being the best. 
And naturally, in the larger space, they wanted to be the best again. There was plenty of room for growth, plenty of room for challenge. By redefining its target markets, GE redefined itself. And it redefined the challenge for its staff. Instead of being a big fish in a small pond, they had the opportunity to sink or swim in an ocean. And it worked. Over the next five years, GE, already one of the larger companies in the world, doubled its revenues, which is an extraordinary feat to do with perspective, to do with changing the question. These days we talk about problem solving as a discrete discipline. In, in England, where I live, problem solving is part of the national curriculum taught in elementary schools. And that's no bad thing. Uh, the teaching of thinking skills is pretty good in my book. The limitation of problem solving is that we only apply it to problems that we recognize. In business, failure is a problem. Success is not. The genius of Jack Welsh is that he changed the question and he asked, what if our success is a problem? What if our success and the way we see our success is the limiting factor? Here in Yukon, mineral extraction is the big success story. Everybody tells me about it wherever I go. Without disparaging the mineral industry, what if its success is a problem? Let's unpack this, that with a few more questions. Given a choice, would you prefer to live in a diversified economy or a non-diversified economy? And if your economy isn't very diversified, would you choose the single industry that you're so heavily exposed to to be the historically boom and bust mineral industry. You're after all the grandchildren of the Klondike gold rushers. You know about this stuff. Here's another question, because I'm not being negative. Without reducing the size of the mining or the mineral industry, what would have to happen to make it amount to no more than 10% of the Yukon economy? Now that's a challenging question that can lead to positive outcomes. Actually, generally, people, uh, people see a question like, what if our success is a problem? It's pretty stupid. But I would argue that great leaps forward that transform society often emerge when creatively dissatisfied people start to question success and ask if there's a larger success to be won. Here's another stupid question. What happens if we pretend a real and obvious problem isn't a problem? I first realized the power of suspended disbelief uh, when I was in discussion with my brilliant team of software architects. We would be problem solving, working on the whiteboard, trying to come up with a design for some large piece of software for a, for a multinational company. And however we talked about it, there would be one sticking point that would block progress. We could never get past it. It was an immovable object. And so, of course, what we would do is we would start to direct all of our energies to trying to sort that problem, because that's the big one that unlocks everything else. And we would get nowhere, because we didn't know how to solve the problem. Some problems are just hard. So in desperation, I would say something like, well, suppose we did have a solution for that problem. Let's just pretend that's OK, big tick. Right, what does the rest of the solution look like? And so the guys would go to work, and they would design a solution. And as this solution developed, somehow we would see the need to solve the hard problem shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. It's amazing how often Suspending disbelief and carrying on as if it's okay, we don't have to solve that problem, somehow lifted a, a shadow over people's thinking and allowed them to be really creative around that and just design the hard problem out. 
There are other occasions when we didn't design the problem out, but by suspending disbelief about the hard problem and working around it, suddenly answers would be suggested that would allow us to go in and solve that problem itself. Suspending disbelief allowed creativity to invent a solution that was literally unthinkable before when we were blocked in our thinking by the sheer difficulty of the insoluble problem. So, um, it's worth asking what the landscape would look like if our big problem wasn't problematic, not just in software settings, but in life. When I started visiting Moldova in the 1990s, it was crippled by economic failure. 88% of the population lived on less than a dollar a day. That's, that's horrible anywhere in the world. In prosperous Europe, it's extraordinarily horrible. The broken economy was like a, a dead weight, crushing uh, all hope and locking the country in a downward spiral of despair. The country's biggest problem was the weakness of its economy. So we asked, what happens if we pretend that isn't a problem at all? What would we do? I remembered somebody once saying to me, identify your greatest strength, sorry, identify your greatest weakness and turn it into your greatest strength. This actually goes one step further than pretending your problem isn't problematic. It actually says, suppose that your problem is an opportunity. Well, of course, in Moldova, the weakness of the economy was an opportunity. Because if you worked cross-border, then it was really inexpensive to hire people in Moldova and to pay them very well uh, in the country, but to get a great bargain across the border. And so that's why we built our business, to create jobs in order to leverage the weakness of the economy into an opportunity. The first day, I gathered all of our staff together and I said, let's set, uh, an, uh, let's set a goal for our company. I want you to be part of it. What's the question we should be asking ourselves as a company? They said, we want to be the best IT company in Moldova. Well, the IT industry in Moldova was non-existent. <laughs> so, so I said, that didn't take long. <laughs> in the end, in the end, the question we set ourselves was perhaps a little counterintuitive. We asked, how can we become so successful that some of our best people will leave to start their own companies and compete against us? Strange question. We changed the question from a conventional, we want to be the best. And what we ended up doing was promoting our own competitors. But I'm very proud and happy to say that 10 years later, the IT industry in Moldova contributed 10% of GDP that had grown from that little seed. And so I believe that changing the question really can change the world. And the challenge I want to throw out to you is, you know Yukon much better than I do. What are the old questions that people have been asking for ages that are producing the same old answers and not moving things forward. How would you change the question and change the world here? Thank you.